All right, excellent. Uh, so John, thanks so much, and Dr. Tessarosa, and uh, also to Sally Dunaway Young and the organizers uh, for this opportunity to uh, try in a in a very short period of time uh, give an overview of uh, some of the current medications, and we're going to focus on the FDA and EMA approved drugs. And we realize this is a global community that's participating here, but hopefully there will be take home messages for everybody. I'm gonna go first and then uh, Dr. Mercury will follow. Uh, so these are uh, our disclosures and we participate in different studies and serve in an advisory capacity. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today are some of the supportive medications within the context of standard of care guidelines. Uh, initial SMN, survival mode and run targeted medication trials and the more recent ones. And then to also highlight both the treatment of the symptomatic and the pre-symptomatic patient and the different treatment options and considerations. And we're just gonna touch briefly on uh, some of the current uh, issues regarding combinatorial treatment. So I will uh, focus on early onset SMA and Dr. Mercury will follow in a few minutes uh, talking about later onset SMA. So I, I think it, it's really important uh, to keep in mind that all of these new drugs, these three wonderful drugs that have been approved for treatment uh, in the US and are emerging in other countries as well to be available for treatment of SMA, they do not work in a vacuum. Um, and that they need to be uh, provided in the context of a, a comprehensive uh, support mechanism. Uh, and we typically look at this as a multidisciplinary uh, type of uh, clinic. Uh, so listed here are some of the supportive medications uh, that we would emphasize. And you can read about this more in the standard of care guidelines that were published uh, just a couple years ago. But obviously important are immunizations. And we would highlight that there's still a concern about which vaccine might be appropriate for patients uh, with SMA and for children. But uh, that will be an important topic. Uh, RSV prophylaxis for the babies, uh, respiratory supportive care, uh, GI supportive care listed here, bone health topics, and making sure that there's good nutritional support. Uh, and again, uh, these, these are each large topics, and you'll hear more of this later uh, in the symposium, but uh, the point again, uh, don't neglect these important supportive care topics when you um, are looking at some of the new uh, treatments. Uh, so this uh, slide highlights uh, about a 15-year course of uh, different clinical trials starting with phenylbutyrate, hydroxyurea, valproic acid, all of which do increase SMN protein in vitro and in animal models. But unfortunately, uh, as you can see here, uh, do not show uh, any uh, support. Here, let me uh, highlight this, uh, go back. Uh, so unfortunately, these were not effective uh, in clinical trials. Uh, there are two drugs that uh, have been looked at uh, that work on downstream modifiers at muscle or mitochondrial function. Um, and those do show uh, perhaps some benefit, but in a limited capacity and are not currently uh, considered primary treatment strategies. Um, uh, there are three FDA approved drugs and in chronologic order, Nusin-Nursin 2016, uh, Rizdaplam, the gene therapy, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the gene therapy is down here. Number two is in uh, May of 2019, and the Rizdaplam, uh, the splicing modifier, uh, in uh, just August of 2020. So we're going to spend most of the time talking about these three drugs um, and in the context of patients with SMA. Oh, sorry, this is touchy. Okay, so uh, for early onset SMA, again, we have uh, these three drugs, Nusinersen, uh, Onosemogene, Abapervavac, and we have Rizdaplam. And there are a variety of different studies put here, and I'm not going to go through each of these uh, in any detail, but just to say that each of these uh, have been shown to be beneficial in symptomatic patients uh, and increasingly also in pre-symptomatic patients, uh, mainly with Newsom Nursen uh, in the Nurture study that data has been published, uh, emerging data on the gene therapy, and there's a study underway called Rainbow Fish that will enroll patients to try to get information on pre-symptomatic patients uh, with Rizdaplam. So this next uh, slide uh, really is the, the take home of what I wanna uh, you to focus on, and we'll make these available for you later. So let's talk about Nusinersen first. And you can see in this table, I have pre-symptomatic up here, uh, and then type one, type two, type three, type four in adults. 
And Dr. Mercury will talk about uh, the older patients, the type two, three, and adults. I'm gonna focus here on the, uh, the early onset. So nusinersen, uh, which is uh, given in a fixed dose of 12 milligrams per dose, it's given intrathecally repeatedly on a maintenance schedule of every four months uh, after they've completed the loading doses. And uh, the FDA approval for United States uh, is very broad. It's for all patients of all ages and all types of SMA. So you see the checkbox in all the different little categories here. Uh, it's also been shown uh, in a clinical trial to be effective in pre-symptomatic patients, the Nurture study, and that's been published. The onisemogene of apervovac, the gene therapy, is uh, given in a weight-based, so it's given 1.1 uh, uh, logarithmic 14, so e to the 14 vector genomes per kilogram, and it's given as a single IV infusion, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it gets to motor neurons. And it's been approved in the United States uh, for patients uh, up to 24 months of age of any weight. Uh, so we're now starting to treat older patients um, up to two years of age who weigh more than in the early clinical trials. Um, but there's limited data about type three patients uh, who might be under two years of age, but present early. Uh, we don't know about that and not really about type four. Now in the EU, uh, the EMA uh, recently approved uh, this gene therapy drug, but in a very different capacity. Uh, so it's for either symptomatic type one patients um, or uh, for patients who have genetically confirmed to have uh, no copies of SMN1 and up to three copies of SMN2, but they can be any age and up to 21 kilos. So this really is a very different situation. So for those of you in Europe and other countries, uh, you're going to have to recognize that uh, what we're doing in the US based upon the FDA approval is different from that in Europe. Um, and this will be emerging over time as the different health authorities um, approve the drug in your country. Uh, Rizdaplam uh, was recently approved in the US uh, for uh, babies two months of age and older. So it's not yet uh, FDA approved under two months of age, but it is being studied in this uh, rainbow fish study for pre-symptomatic. So that may fill that gap. Uh, now, there's different dosing, and I've just summarized it here. Um, so between two months and two years of age, it's 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per day. And this is given as a daily oral medication. And then if you're um, two years of age or older, then if, if you're under 20 kilograms in weight, it's, it's 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per day. And if you're 20 kilograms or over, then it's a fixed dose of five milligrams per day. So you really have to look at the dosing guidelines carefully. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on and try to give a little more uh, details on the three drugs. Nusinersen is an antisense oligonucleotide. As I mentioned, it's delivered intrathecally in loading doses and then maintenance doses. It has both FDA and EMA approval, and it's now been treated in over 11,000 patients globally. It has a very strong safety profile. Uh, there are some uh, technical considerations for your site. It does require having a group that can do repeated lumbar punctures. Uh, some of these patients need sedation. And we do have to monitor for some uh, potential toxicity, such as proteinuria or coagulopathy. But having said that, uh, we're actually not seeing that, um, in, in particular in this uh, patient population with intrathecal administration. It's more a concern of some of the ASOs delivered systemically. And we're starting to get some real world data that's emerging for older type one patients, type two patients, and then Dr. Mercury will talk more about some of the older patients here. So there are a lot of clinical trials that supported this. There was a phase one, two, three, and I'm not gonna go into any of this in detail, um, but just highlighting here in blue um, are the studies that are still ongoing and even some new studies, DEVOTE that's gonna be looking at a higher dose um, rather than the 12 milligrams, looking at a higher dose in the SMA population, and also a RESTORE study looking at uh, adding uh, nusinersen after patients have been treated uh, with the gene therapy. Uh, so this is still an evolving topic. So here's a baby with SMA type one uh, at baseline. Uh, here's the same child, very symptomatic as you can see, but here we are three years later um, making rather remarkable progress. Uh, so this is a very typical patient, not my best, not my weakest, but certainly a very symptomatic patient. And he's continuing to make progress um, since this video was taken uh, three years ago. 
Uh, there was a phase three study that showed a remarkable response in those patients treated versus the sham control. And this was really the basis for the FDA and EMA approval. Uh, and I want to point out that there is an open label long-term extension study. So those patients who are in these earlier clinical trials are now being followed in uh, longer term open label extension studies. Uh, and this data is being presented at different meetings. And what it basically is showing is that uh, these patients are, are sustaining the gains that they've made. Um, so one of the questions we want to know with each of these drugs is, uh, are the gains that we've seen, are they sustained over time? What's the durability of the effect? So with at least nurse and nurse, and we have several years of data and we're seeing that there is a strong durability and, and a strong safety profile. So going now to uh, uh, the, uh, and for sake of time, I'm gonna skip over a couple of things here. Uh, let's go on to the gene therapy. Uh, so this is the, it was originally called AVXS 101. Um, if you look at the early presentations, uh, it's, it's called onesemogene of a pervovac is the uh, generic, and it's an AAV9 vector with an SMN1 transgene, and it's given, as I mentioned, a single dose IV, uh, and it has this conditional uh, authorization in the EU and uh, limited FDA approval, as I showed you on the earlier chart. Uh, now, there are some things to keep in mind. We have to look for uh, the any evidence of pre-existing antibodies to the AAV9 uh, viral vector that's going to be delivering uh, the gene uh, to the motor neurons. Fortunately, that seems to be low. It's, it's reported that about only 8% of the babies and children are having that uh, antibody, which might preclude them from getting the treatment at that time. Uh, you might be able to wait a little longer and, and do it down the road. There are certainly some risks that be, need to be identified uh, when you deliver gene therapy, and those are well described uh, by the company in the um, uh, the product information, uh, hepatic, hematologics, and cardiac issues, uh, and also they have to be treated with steroids for at least a couple months, so they're immune suppressed. Uh, so with the gene therapy, the original study was a low dose and a high dose, and it showed uh, rather remarkable improvement on a motor function scale with a very early onset and improvement and heat hitting more or less a ceiling effect here. And uh, that was very persuasive. And, and this is an unusual situation where a phase one study actually uh, was the basis for FDA approval. There have been subsequent studies that have been performed. Um, let me mention just briefly that in this phase one study, small number of patients, but event-free survival was remarkable at 100% versus 25% in a natural history study, and about half of the babies were sitting unassisted uh, at, a, at about a year of age, so versus none in the natural history. So again, a very strong phase one study that led to FDA approval. Uh, there's been a, a supportive phase three study, which shows very similar data with a very good uh, survival on this Kaplan-Meier curve as compared to a natural history study. And uh, the majority of the patients um, uh, are achieving sitting for at least 30 seconds and, and at least one of them uh, was walking. So these are symptomatic patients and this was reported recently at a medical conference by Dr. Day. Um, importantly also is a lot of these patients uh, have needed no uh, non-invasive ventilation support and no um, uh, feeding support at any time during the study. So there seems to be a strong effect not only on motor function but also on respiratory and feeding vulvar function. Turning now to Rizdaplam, it's a small molecule drug. It's also a splicing modifier, very similar to how Nusen Nursen works. So it's delivered daily. Uh, and it seems to have very good effects at the level of the motor neuron and perhaps even muscle. Um, there's a risk of uh, off-target toxicity. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, but we're gonna still need to keep an eye out. So fortunately, it has a very safe uh, safety profile in the FDA. Uh, labeling doesn't really require uh, any monitoring in the way of uh, laboratory studies or ophthalmologic tests or the such, but still, you know, it's early days and we need to keep our eye out and watch for this. Uh, and the clinical trials did show some uh, efficacy uh, in children and older adults up to 25 years of age. Again, Dr. McCurry will touch base on this. Uh, so uh, the Vistaplam, it was uh, for the infants was the firefish study. And here, uh, 
So these were very symptomatic type one patients and about 29% achieved sitting for at least five seconds uh, 12 months after starting onset. And the data on the left just shows that you can measure the SMN protein in blood uh, and it's, it seems to uh, parallel quite nicely uh, tissue concentrations in brain uh, in the upper panel and also in uh, muscle and in spinal fluid. So uh, we have a biomarker that uh, uh, might prove to be quite useful here. So with that, I'm gonna turn briefly to pre-symptomatic. Uh, there's an algorithm that's been published and you'll hear more about uh, pre-symptomatic treatment by other speakers uh, tomorrow uh, in the next coming days. So but we do feel that there's an urgency uh, to identify and treat the pre-symptomatic patient, particularly those with two or three copies, those that are likely or predicted to be type one SMA. Uh, and there is a, uh, this is just one baby I'm gonna show briefly in the nurture study, um, uh, who you can see is at a year of age, looks very healthy. And then here he is a little bit later uh, where he's walking. Uh, and then here's a cute little girl getting ready to go to school. So it, remarkably different uh, phenotype when you see that you can treat the patient uh, pre-symptomatically uh, as opposed to waiting until they're symptomatic and treating them. Uh, and this, was, this improvement was shown again on a motor function scale. Here's the symptomatic type one patients on two studies showing a slow, steady improvement in motor function and the more robust response that was seen in the pre-symptomatic patients. Notice that those uh, with three copies uh, of SMN2 do a bit better than those with uh, two copies as shown here. Both do remarkably well, but not quite uh, equivalent. Uh, and this was shown also in the SPRINT study, which is using uh, the gene therapy, the Anasema gene Abaparvovac. And you can see those with the babies uh, pre-symptomatically uh, who have three copies, all of them are following a normal trajectory on the Bailey uh, gross motor scale uh, within these gray bars of a typically developing baby. And you can see that many of those with two copies of SMN2 are also uh, in the normal range, but a few, even though they're making remarkable gains, seem to be lagging a little bit behind uh, a typically developing child. So there's more to be learned here, uh, particularly in the babies with two copies. And then uh, there is a, a study, Rainbow Fish, that's just now enrolling. We don't have data yet uh, on that, but that should be emerging in the next couple of years. So with that, I'm gonna stop and now uh, turn it over to Dr. Mercury, uh, who's going to talk about later onset SMA. Uh, Eugenio? Um, thank you, Richard. I think I can share my screen now. Mm. Okay. okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. That looks good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, want, I also want to thank the John and the other organizers uh, to, to have me here and to, to discuss a bit on uh, um, the, the, the other therapeutical intervention in older children or in the children who had the later onset SMA. Under this umbrella of later onset SMA, we mainly include in the running clinical trials patients with we use to classify as type 2, but uh, there are others uh, who may be also type 3 um, recognized very early. What I'm going to discuss is to um, how do we have some results from the early studies with, with Nusi Nursen, uh, and uh, um, these have been mainly focusing on young SMA patients. We have now follow-up studies uh, of, of the CHERRY study reporting data in older children, but we also have new trials using RISDIPLAM uh, that have been involving both relatively young children, older children, and adults. Uh, and in terms of adults, we have a lot of real-world data which are now becoming increasingly available uh, in, in adults treated with nusinersen. You have heard about uh, uh, nusinersen, and the CHERRY study was a double-blind placebo control, sham control uh, trial where children were giving nusinersen 12 milligram or with a ratio of two to one, uh, a sham procedure. And uh, these patients were relatively young because they were uh, the, 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 the inclusion criteria were between two and 12, but in practical terms, most of the children were younger than eight years. And if we look at the results, we see that uh, uh, there was a treatment effect. Uh, in, on the first graph, you can see the gray bars uh, uh, pointing downwards, which are the sham control patients who showed both on the interim and at the end of the study, 
a mild reduction in scores, which is consistent with what we see in uh, natural history. While the patients, while the, the bars in green indicate the patients who were treated with nusinersen, and you can see that there was an improvement of four, an, a mean improvement of four points, which is different from the minimal reduction we see uh, in the uh, placebo treated children. And uh, in, in the first, in, in the second part of the graph, you can see how the placebo may show a minimal improvement soon after they are treated, uh, either because some of them may have not been. Uh, familiar with the scales and uh, there is a, le a minimal learning effect at the beginning or a minimal placebo effect, but this doesn't last. And uh, while the placebo will then show a deterioration, treated patients continue to improve. And again, these are the results uh, on, of, the, of the CHERISH of the first 18 months that also showed uh, a similar improvement in the upper limb function assessed with the room. The, um, the, the CHERRY study has transitioned uh, um, together with other studies on Nusinersen into the SHINE study, an open label extension that is a, a long term uh, open label extension study up to five years. And uh, in this study, both the, the patients who were already treated as part of the CHERISH, but also the one who received the sham procedures, they all transitioned into the, um, into the, the SHINE. And one difference at the time the transition was that uh, uh, the, um, well, of course, the, the one who had placebo had to be um, treated with a loading dose, but also that the frequency of treatment, which was six months in the CHERISH study became um, um, to, of four months, similar to what we use uh, with the commercially available drug. And uh, um, the results of the SHINE show that uh, this population that uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in part is, is, well, it was all older than, than the CHERISH, but there were also older patients who were young at the time when they were in CHERISH and they were receiving a SHAM at the time when they were receiving the, the Nusinersen and were older. And it's nice to see that on the long-term follow-up, uh, there were no serious adverse events and, uh, and uh, um, relatively little adverse events that we noticed in the CHERISH were, were also confirmed in the SHINE. There were no additional concern. And in terms of um, uh, um, changes over time, we can see that in gray here, the lower part of the graph, shows the children, sorry, shows the children who uh, were um, treated with uh, sham uh, in the, at the time of the, uh, of the, um, of the cherry study and in blue, the part uh, when they started uh, treatment after uh, the sham period. In the green are the children who are all in Lucinaris. And you can see that uh, there is uh, some improvement over time. And then the Cherish, in whom we already saw an improvement, and, and these were younger than the one who were uh, in, with the sham at the time of the Cherish, there was still some additional improvement uh, uh, after the end of the Cherish uh, with the continuation of treatment. So the conclusion of uh, uh, this part uh, uh, is, is really that uh, we can see a, a very good safety profile, which was consistent with what previously reported. And there are some improvements that are obvious both on the Hammersmith and on the upper limb, uh, revised upper limb scale. And uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the new schedule did not uh, produce any change in adverse events, uh, but uh, showed, uh, could, showed some improvement over time. And this is the uh, the the the, the RISDIPLAM study. Uh, Richard has already um, talked about what RISDIPLAM is, uh, and uh, in this study, the, the primary endpoint uh, was the MFM thirty two, and uh, there was a, a, a change from baseline of the MFM thirty two. And when we looked at the RISDIPLAM and at the placebo, we see that when the placebo, while the placebo show a minimal decrease, the RISDIPLAM treated showed some increase in. Uh, uh, in the MFM32, and the similar increase will, was also seen using the, 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 the upper limb uh, module, uh, the, the scale for, 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 for function. And uh, uh, this, is the, um, this is the Sunfish study, and uh, uh, this was a positive placebo control trial of Christiplum. And uh, um, what is important in this, uh, in this cohort is that this was a broader patient population that the one uh, we have seen in CHERISH or in other studies, because uh, this included uh, type 2 and non-ambulant type 3 with a wide age range. There were children 
uh, and ad young adults up to the age of 25, uh, 25 years. So for the first time we have seen uh, um, in a clinical trial with a placebo, the difference between treated and untreated. And uh, uh, th this gives more details of uh, the improvement we have seen on the MFM32 with the scale, with the improvements are relatively small, in, uh, but uh, there is definitely a difference which is statistically significant between Ristiplan and uh, uh, placebo. And uh, the same applies to the upper limb module, but not to the, to the Hamrest mate. Um, talking about older patients and adults, there has been uh, a, a lot of evidence of uh, efficacy of nusinersen in real world uh, uh, population treated with nusinersen. There are a lot of studies, there are studies from, from the US and these are uh, some of the studies with more um, patients which have been published, but many other studies have been published since. And I just want to show you briefly the, probably the largest study published on Lancet by Tim Hagenacker and, uh, and the German network on, on SMA. And uh, you can see that uh, the, these are, um, this is a quite large population and, uh, um, and, and, and the, the mean age was at 36, of 36 years at, at the time they were treated after six months. And of course they become older and the numbers are relatively big. And uh, in the next slide, we can see very nicely, if you look at the mean scores on the uh, on the scales across the 6, 10 and 14 months, you can see that, uh, uh, let's say the Hammersmith was started as a, uh, after six months was 22.47 between, which became 25 and 27. There is an increased score, which was quite consistent on the Hammersmith, on the room, and also relatively on the on the six minute walk test uh, with, a, with a difference uh, uh, of, uh, 3.12 points on the Hammersmith, over one point on the Rulm, and over 46 meters on the six minute walk test. And these results are all statistically significant, um, but uh, uh, there is a statistically significant difference, but uh, um, they, th there is a lot to be discussed on how the different scale relate to each other and what uh, uh, different scales are measuring in different children, different type of adults, because uh, when we say adults, we are really talking of a large group uh, uh, that included uh, uh, type 2 patients, type 3 who had lost ambulation, ambulant type 3. So uh, it will be important uh, to go and try to identify which scales are better capturing the improvements seen in the different subgroups. A similar experience on, a, on, on another large cohort is also has also been collected by uh, the Italian network. And I, this is a complicated table. I just want you to look at the number of responders uh, in all types and uh, in the using uh, the different scales in the different subtypes. And, and you can see uh, from, uh, from, this, uh, from this table that uh, the scales are capturing uh, different population, ca capturing changes in different populations. So it will be very important to, uh, to have a better idea of, of uh, responders and non-responders in the individual subgroups based on uh, uh, type of SMA, SMN2 copy number and functional status. Uh, and very briefly, I just want to touch on other approaches. So far, we have been mainly focuses on gene replacing therapies or on therapies acting on splicing, but there are also appro other approaches which are targeting uh, more peripherally either the motoneurons, uh, working on the metabolism of motoneurons, uh, or uh, um, or uh, directly the muscle and uh, the olexozim um, that uh, um, a study that started with trophos and then was taken over by roche was a mitochondrial stabilizer for the motoneurons and possibly for muscle as well was an oral drug and the phase two study which was completed showed a difference on the mfm between the treated and the untreated patients unfortunately uh, this uh, uh, molecule has been discontinued for the time being, uh, um, following some difficulties in getting this approved, uh, but the results were promising, especially at the time when other therapies are available, may, may have been useful as a possible combination therapy. Another uh, approach which has, uh, which has been used in a clinical trial, there is an ongoing trial using uh, the CK2127107 from cytokinetics. This is a small molecule activator 
of the uh, type 2 uh, muscle troponin complex and the suppose or the, the, the aim is to, to improve muscle fatigue. It, again, is an oral drug and uh, the study is ongoing is continuing to recruit and there are um, no interim results. And uh, the last of the approaches is another ongoing study. Um, and this, this is uh, um, targeting the muscle and more specifically uh, is an inhibitor of the, of the myostatin or, or the myostatin cascade. Uh, and the aim of uh, uh, this uh, drug is to try to increase muscle volume, muscle trophism, uh, and uh, the interim results uh, of uh, the ongoing clinical trial, which is targeting three different populations, are again very promising. So um, I think there are a lot of exciting uh, results from, from uh, both from clinical trials and from uh, real world data. And uh, this, this will be important because we still have to understand how the benefits of the drugs relate to each other. We know there are differences in the mechanism of action, in the mode of delivery, that we know that each of these drugs has some advantages, uh, like nusinersen has uh, the longest follow-up, has the disadvantage of being uh, having to be administered intrathecally, and each of them has advantages and potential disadvantages. So it will be very important, especially for the drugs which are now commercially available, to be sure that we capture all the details we, we have so that we can have a large population where we, we can draw a map of responders and non-responders to the different drug. In general, uh, it looks like that uh, even if we are very happy that we have all these uh, exciting results and uh, we see significant changes in the natural history and in the progression of, of the disease, uh, we still have an, a number of questions that have to be answered. Um, long-term uh, results on, on, on individual treatments or on sequential treatments, uh, especially at the time when the combination may, may become available, not only between the available drugs, but also as is happening with Scholar Rock, with new trials that may consider the idea of combining an existing drug, an existing commercially available drug with a, with a new uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, there are a, num a number of, of uh, um, of, of other questions that uh, uh, are open uh, in terms of defining the trajectories, responders and non-responders, but also what will be the effect of uh, the newborn screening that are becoming increasingly available. And again, this will be discussed at length during, during, during this meeting, uh, but it will be very interesting to see the long-term effect of the, of the, of the new, uh, of the, of the newborn screening um, see how if the, very promising results on the early milestones will be maintained over time. And of course, there, is a, uh, there, there are issues on the access to these therapies uh, and to the cost of these therapies, especially at the time when we start discussing uh, uh, combination. So a lot to uh, learn, a lot to understand about uh, new phenotypes and possible new standards of care uh, on the basis of the new phenotype. So, all very exciting, but still a lot of work to do. Uh, to do. So, um, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And I think there is there may still by, be times for some questions. Uh, thanks, Eugenio and Richard. That was uh, fantastic, and uh, obviously tremendously exciting time.